and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So we do have, uh, once we get settled here, Sam will ask you to give a report on closed session. The council considered both agenda items and direction was given to staff. Thank you. City Clerk, any additional materials? Yes, we received three additional material items, one for item 10A, one for 10B, and one for 10D. Um, 10B is up at the dais. Um, the most recent, there were some number changes in the staff report oh, right. um, okay. for the, uh, the garbage rates. Oh, that's not 10B, sorry. Um, 90. 90, thank you. Right. And um, good news is they're lower, <laughs> so you'll see the correction in red. Okay. Lower is good. Okay, let's move on to um, any additions and deletions in the agenda. Staff has no changes. Okay, so this is a time for public comments on anything not on the agenda. Uh, come forward, and if you'd like, you put your name on the uh, dais there, and you have three minutes. Hi, Sheree McCoy, Capitola Residence. And the light will come on sin signifying you're starting. Okay. The purpose of the Capitola Mall is to make money for Capitola. These days, many consumers shop online and a trip to the mall is unnecessary. We need a special place that is much more than just for shopping, a true destination spot where people can spend their money and enjoy a unique Capitola experience. When Merlone Geyer Partners presented their proposal for redevelopment, they showed pictures of the Venetian, the Six Sisters, and other examples of Capitola architecture. Then they showed drawings with their interpretation for a new Capitola aesthetic. The renderings do not reflect the charm of Capitola in any way. They look like any other ugly mall in America, in America with high-density housing slapped onto it. The proposal dedicates a considerable amount of property and amenities exclusively for new residential use. Courtyards filled with relaxing green space, turf for outdoor games, activities, and exercise, group gathering spaces, expansive bar seating, and relaxing lounge nooks. Amenities such as these should be in the grand plan for all mall patrons, not for newly created residents with a seven-story building wrapped around an eight-level parking lot and a five-story building wrapped around a six-level parking lot and their 1,100 cars. Unrealistically, the renderings show a handful of vehicles with people happily walking in front of the cars. Creating new streets for residential access and shoppers will not eliminate the traffic on the surrounding streets. New streets with a four-way intersection in the middle of the project does not build community, it builds separation. Research indicates that residential use for this site is not profitable for Capitola. Emitting housing from the project will also free up the massive amount of green space the plan reserves exclusively for residential use. Outdoor dining doesn't have to be eating at a table on a sidewalk thoroughfare next to streetcars. Outdoor dining should be patrons in a relaxing place to get away from it all, including escape from the car exhaust, loud Bluetooth conversations, blaring radios, honking horns, and cussing from drivers waiting for motorists to hurry up and navigate the angled parking spaces on the street. Although the plan frowns on orphan buildings, it calls for isolated units that introduce sidewalk-oriented commercial buildings along 41st Avenue street frontage. Let your temporal forces guide you to preserve Capitola's unique cultural and historic character and happy holidays to one and all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. Anyone else would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll come back to city council and staff comments. And that's, oh, is it? No? No comments. No comments. 
Okay, um, this will be my last time as mayor of City of Capitola, at least for this time, this period of time. And um, so I have a few comments. Be very brief. So in this last year, I've been very impressed with the fact that this city comes forward when challenges are confronted. We've had a number of hearings on various issues like the downtown hotel proposal. We've had um, complexities related to uh, city planning membership. Um, and we've had a large response when Roland Geyer has presented its plans to us. So that indicates to me that we have a healthy community. We have people that pay attention to what's going on in this community. We have people that are willing to come to us to the city hall meetings and other meetings that we've had and comment, often saying things that they know people may not agree with, but it doesn't matter. They're here expressing their opinions. And I want to encourage the citizens of Capitola to continue doing that. I want to further encourage you to get more involved because that's what makes us a healthy community. When I first moved to Capitola over 20 years ago, maybe it's 23 or 25, I can't even remember how long I've been married. I always forget these things. But when I first became involved, that was one thing that impressed me. And it's been a constant. Many people that I've met on the street, and I walk the streets a lot, talk often about how they know their neighbors. They talk often about how they feel comfortable walking around the city. They feel safe. Our police, but also the community that's part of us is making that a safe environment. So these are things that you as residents contribute. You contribute by being a participant. You, con you contribute by making your presence known in this community. The second point is this community is actually very complicated. There's many different organizations. There's volunteer organizations. There's groups that are connected with city um, nonprofits, groups that are connected with um, efforts on, God, so many different things. If you have an issue, maybe connected with the RTC or connected with something that's happening in terms of housing, there are multi-levels of groups that people can get involved in, and I encourage you to do so. So with that, I'd like to also point out a few things. Um, I witnessed a confrontation uh, in one of the commercial areas the other day, and it was between a resident and some of our police officers. And I asked the chief about it. I was very encouraged to know that what happened was an effort to talk this person down from the situation that was riling that person up. I really like to give a shout out to the police. I know the chief has put in training so that this is now a natural way that we deal with issues that are on the street. Heretofore, in many other areas of this county and maybe in this country, people are arrested, given citations, and maybe hauled away. I have a special thanking, I think, to our police department for acting in this way to calm people down and to recognize that sometimes things just aren't working right. Um, I, I witnessed this also at a Starbucks. I was in a Starbucks. A lot of you know that I go to many different places so I could talk to people. And the lady behind the counter, there was someone sitting next to me just going crazy. The lady behind the counter came over and talked to this person. The person calmed down, actually apologized said that just something ticked them off. And for the rest of the half hour I was there, it was fine. So I think this bespeaks to something about how we interact with people. Just realize that sometimes it's a little bit difficult and also realize sometimes we don't have to, ag uh, excuse me, magnify the situation, make it into something it actually isn't. So my shout out to the police department. Also, I'd like to shout out to our, our uh, streets, and, uh, streets and Road Division run by Steve, there's a lot of people up by the uh, McCormick Triangle. We now have a little pseudo park, and it's a great thing. The people in the neighborhood love it. There's a seat there that people sit on and such like that, and everyone is feeling a lot more pride about their little neighborhood, and I completely think it's a wonderful thing that Steve's department did. There's many other things like this. I'm just thinking of two. So. When you think about why you like this city, it's not just the people that live here. 
It's also the services that the city provides. Just like you rake up the leaves in front of your lawn, you, you keep your street clean, you put out your garbage, you do all these things. The people that work for the city of Capitola do these things for the city in general. And that's what we learn to expect, but don't take it for granted. So when you see someone that is part of the city here, hey, say hello. Wave to them. Make them know that they're part of the community. The reasons why I give these comments is because being mayor for a year has made me realize the richness of this community, and it's also made me realize how interdependent we are in terms of making sure it's the place we want to live in and keep being involved so we stay that way. Thank you. So, Mayor Batron, before we move forward, uh, the staff and the council would like to present you with a gift to thank you for your service oh. in this last year as mayor. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, I will open it now. <laughs> when I was in business and marketing, I had to travel all over the place, and I went to Japan, and I was told, it was told you have to give gifts. So I gave gifts, but I was also told it was impolite to have them open in front of you. So, I mean, there's cultural differences all over the world, and, you know, I had to take a course on culture sensitivity, but in Capitola, you open up the present. <laughs> a trick package. It's yeah. definitely a trick package. <laughs> okay. It's very true. I don't know. How'd you get it in here? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to item 7-1, and this is City Council Reorganization for the selection of mayor and vice mayor. Um, I'd like to open it for nominations. Ed, you seem to always have something to say. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> um, I think uh, just an announcement I'd like to make for the public watching in case they don't know, and that is that in Capitola, we don't uh, elect a mayor, we appoint a mayor. And every year, we, uh, the council, uh, who are all proud to serve here, select the person that they feel is best suited to be the face of that city because what you see now is that uh, although we all serve as council members, uh, a lot of the public flocks to the mayor and, and the advice that that person may give. So it's a, a extreme honor to be the mayor of Capitola, I believe. And uh, with that, it gives me great pleasure to nominate Kristen Peterson for mayor for 2020. Is there a second? I'll second that nomination. Okay, um, any discussion? I don't think we need any. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Story. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Bator? Aye. And Mayor Bertrand? <laughs> Aye. Okay. With that, I hand you the gap. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Get all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Quick reorganization of the dais as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're not thirsty? No. Oh. Not yet. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, I am honored to serve in this position in the coming year, and I thank uh, my fellow council members for your faith in me to hold this position on the council, and I will uh, do my best to make you proud. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the second part of item seven in reorganization. Uh, which is consideration of a vice mayor for 2020. Uh, is there any discussion or is there anyone from the public that would like to address the council on this before we consider a nomination? Saying now, we'll bring it back to the council for a nomination. Uh, I would be proud to nominate Councilwoman Brooks to be vice mayor. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Shall we do a roll call vote again? Sure. Why not? Your pleasure. Council Member Story. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. Aye. Council Member Brooks? Aye. Council Member Bator? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Congratulations. Yeah. 
And again, quick reorganization of some seating. Uh, and if there's, uh, unless there's any objections, we'll save any other rotations of seats or any other changes for um, our upcoming okay. meeting. <laughs> Sound good? General consent? Excellent. I'm, I'm happy down here. So. Okay. And I think Ed's happy down there. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm at the will of mayor and vice mayor. <laughs> You are right here, sir. Here, I'm going to move this over here for you. Actually, the most important thing is the candy that are under there. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, do you have any uh, brief comments before we move on? Um, I just received a text message from my husband saying that he logged on with my five-year-old daughter to watch this, and that just fills too much in my heart, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, we're gonna move on in tonight's meeting to item eight, boards, commissions, and committee appointments. Uh, 8A is appoint art and cultural commission members. Do we have a staff report? Just a uh, oral. Uh, we have three seats that are um, open, which were advertised, we, and we have three members who expressed interest in being reappointed. Um, as is the practice in the bylaws, that is supported by the uh, full council, um, the Art and Cultural Commission. So we have the reappointment of um, Callahan, Wallace, and I'm missing the third. Hill. 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 Lori Hill. Lori Hill, thank you. Um, and it, it is at the council's pleasure. Thank you. Uh, is there any member of the, excuse me, is there any questions from the council on this item? No questions? Is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this matter? Seeing none, we're going to bring it back to the council for a discussion. Any discussion? No? Nope. Nope. I'm waiting to hear from the representative from the Arts and Cultural Commission. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ed. Um, well, I, I think um, I just, I mean, I've worked with uh, all three of these individuals um, over the past year. Um, um, and. Um, they're just all very hardworking volunteers for the community. They, d they have done and continue to do so much toward um, enhancing public art in our community. Um, there have been numerous projects that they've been uh, involved in. Um, and with that, I would like to make a motion that the council consider reappointing Mary Beth Cahalan, Lori Hill, and James Wallace at the, as the at-large members uh, for the Capitola Arts and Cultural Commission. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Any abstentions? Motion carries. We're going to move on to 8B, appointment of a youth member to Art and Cultural Commission. I'm very excited to announce this. This is the last open spot we have for a youth member. So Great. we now have, um, should it be your pleasure to appoint him. Um, a youth member on all of the boards which um, have eligible spots. So Fantastic. Um, that, that is a very positive milestone. And this nominee is um, Aiden McKenzie. Uh, grew up in Capitola. Had the opportunity also to be interviewed by the Arts Commission. They have recommended his appointment. Um, is Aiden here? He is not. Okay. And um, so it is at the council's pleasure. Great. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the council? A member of the public that would like to address the council on this matter? Seeing none, we're going to bring it back to the council for a discussion. I'll yes. start out. It was Aiden that approached me, and I met with him actually uh, to discuss getting involved with the city. And he actually is a neighbor of Sam's, lives about five doors down from Sam. But um, comes from a great family, uh, very enthusiastic, said he wanted to get involved and run the city. And I said, well, let's start off a little bit you know, go down the road <laughs> and you can get to run in the city. But I, I, I just a uh, great, great person, a lot of enthusiasm, and uh, I'd like to make a motion that we appoint him to the Art and Culture Commission. Do you have a motion? Have I'll, a second? I'll, I'll second that motion. And if I may add, um, uh, you know, I've, I've known Aiden all his life. Um, and, um, and he was at the uh, last meeting that we had last uh, Tuesday night. Um, and, you know, I've been involved with the uh, Capital Arts Commission for probably going on 30 years now. And this is the first time that we've had a youth member. So I am so pleased that he's willing to step up 
uh, you know, be involved, be engaged, and participate in the Arts Commission. Um, and it could, it is the stepping stone to greater things in our community. So we'll see where this takes Aiden. So thank you. Great. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Nope. Motion carries unanimously. Great. Congratulations. All right. Oh, uh, we have item 8C, consider Council Financial Advisory Commission membership. Yes, the um, charter for the Finance Advisory Commission uh, requires two members of the Council to sit on this body and gives first right of refusal to the Mayor and the Vice Mayor. So we would like to know at this point whether the Mayor and the Vice Mayor intend to um, take those seats or if they would like to have others appointed in their place. Depending on that decision, we may also need to open up um, nominations for um, representatives because um, the, of the domino effect. We may ha have other positions that we will then need to recruit from the public. Okay. Uh, any questions from council on this? Any member of the public that would like to address the council? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Uh, I personally would like to continue in my role on the Finance Advisory uh, Committee, Council uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, um, so I'll be stepping in as well on the fact, and I just wanna uh, make sure that we, I recognize Doug Crowder, who was my previous appointment um, for his, his dedication this past year. So thanks to Doug. Absolutely. So do we need a vote on this or is this just a, okay. So what will happen though is now we have a vacancy Mm -hmm. And so oh, right. uh, the city clerk will be advertising the vacancy and then it'll come back to the council and I believe it'll be council member for trans appointment then once you've advertised the vacancy for you to make the appointment. Yes. Has Doug reached out or have we? Um, not until we have gone through this process. Okay. So Thank I will um, notify him and it is as it is required in the, by um, state law, we have to open it up to everyone and after right. that point we will bring it back. But uh, the commission does not meet again until February. So this taking this action at this time gives us plenty of time to make do that outreach, so thank you. Great, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to consent calendar. Uh, these are items that will be enacted by one motion. Um, is there any member of the public that would like to address the council uh, regarding any items on the consent calendar or would like any item pulled for separate discussion and consideration? Seeing none, is there anyone on the council that would like anyone from consent calendar moved for separate discussion? Seeing none, we will entertain a motion. I so move. Separate consent calendar. I, do we need to accept the motion with the changes that were presented to item 9D earlier by staff? Good call. Okay. I you get a uh, clarification from staff? I moved your consent calendar with the updates provided by it, the city clerk. Yeah, it, it doesn't affect the, um, the resolution. It was not the resolution wording, this just the staff. This is the okay. replacement. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. So we have, a, I'm sorry, did we have a second? Yes. I'll, I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Nope. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to general government and public hearings. Item 10A, consider an appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of a tree removal permit for a coastal redwood at 1600 49th Avenue. Do we have a staff report? Yes, we do. Thank you, uh, Mayor Peterson and Council. <coughs> The item before you tonight is an appeal of a Planning Commission denial of a tree removal permit to remove a coastal redwood tree near an existing single family residence in the single family residential zoning district. This evening staff will describe the tree removal application process and present the appeal. Next, the appellant will be given the opportunity to speak and answer any uh, city council questions. The mayor will then open the public portion of the hearing and that will be followed by a city council discussion and decision. Most tree removal permits uh, reviewed and are reviewed and approved at the staff level, indicated by the track on the left here. They begin with a prelimin preliminary review from public works staff who can approve the removal of a non-heritage tree if findings for removal can be made. If findings cannot be made, the application is transferred to planning staff for further review. The city may require the applicant to pay for an arborist under contract to the city to provide an arborist report for the tree. The community development director will then make a determination based on the findings in the arborist report. As noted in the staff report, the current appeal before you went through the required steps and the permit was denied by the community development director based on the arborist findings. An appeal of the community development director determination to the planning commission was received on May 28, 2019. 
A subsequent appeal was made to the City Council on October 13, 2019. The tree proposed for removal is a coastal redwood located in the front yard of 1649th Avenue, approximately five feet from the side property line. The tree is several feet in diameter at breast height with a large canopy. The lower canopy extends over the northwest corner of the appellant's residence. The canopy extends into the adjacent property at 4910 Capitola Road, but is not over the residence. The tree is not a heritage tree and not located in an environmentally sensitive habitat area. Here's a couple of views of the property showing the canopy extent in relation to the two homes. In January 2019, the tree experienced a branch failure as shown on the right, uh, sorry, left. Uh, in March 2019, the tree experienced a second branch failure. The tree experienced a third branch failure in November 2019. In order for either the Community Development Director, Planning Commission, or City Council to approve the removal of a non-heritage tree, the same review process applies. At least one finding for removal must be made and there must be no feasible alternatives including trimming. The findings, which include the health of the tree, safety considerations, and property damage are shown here. They will be addressed individually in the following slides. The first criterion considers the health or condition of the tree with respect to disease, infestation, or danger of falling. Public Works staff, the consulting arborist, and the forester all considered the tree to be in good health. Although branch tip damage from marine air was addressed by the forest, forester and arborist, neither indicated that the damage was a concern to the overall tree health. Based on the assessment, staff could not make a finding of removal from the health or condition of the tree. Second consideration is safety. The arborist stated that the tree did not appear to have been pruned or managed in a manner that would decrease branch failure potential. He added that maintenance pruning would address present safety considerations. Based on the ability to mitigate future risk of branch failure through proper maintenance, staff could not make a finding of removal for safety considerations. The third consideration for removal is situations where a tree has caused or has the potential to cause unreasonable property damage and or interference with existing utility services. According to the arborist, the tree is not at risk for total failure or falling over. Concerns for potential property damage pertain to the loss of branches. As with considerations for safety, these concerns can be addressed through the maintenance pruning of branches. Based on the ability to mitigate future risk of branch failure through proper maintenance, staff could not make a finding of removal for a tree that has caused or has the potential to cause unreasonable property damage. The fourth consideration is that all possible and feasible alternatives to tree removal have been evaluated, including but not limited to undergrounding of utilities, selective root cutting, trimming, and relocation. This finding must be made in conjunction with one of the previous findings for removal. Based on the alternative described in the Arbor Support, staff could not make a finding that no feasible alternatives exist and therefore denied their permit. So with that, staff recommends that the City Council deny the appeal and uphold the Planning Commission denial of the tree removal application and the approval of the pruning measures established in the Arborist Report. Thank you. We'll bring it back to Council for any questions. I'll start at this end. Sam, any questions? Yeah, maybe. Matt, thank you for that um, report. I, I guess I did have one question of clarification on the Arborist Report and which you spoke to. Um, in his report, I read where he states that um, there's no reported history of tree maintenance by the current owner. The subject tree does not appear to have been pruned or managed, and it states in a manner that would decrease branch failure potential. So my question, I, I read in the record that the current owners have done um, some trimming and attempted to do some maintenance back in 2012, 2013, and that's not reflected in the Arbor's report. So I guess my question is, is he saying that he could see that it had been trimmed, but it wasn't trimmed in a manner that would decrease branch failure? Yes, or is I he saying that he didn't see, or he's saying that there was no trimming done to the tree? At the time of the report, I don't believe he'd received um, from the appellant um, the information about the year in which they got the trimming done, but was stating that some trimming work had been done, but not in a way that uh, he would advise proper trimming. It sounded like more of um, branch removal, full branch removal rather than tipping, I think it's called, to manage how the tree grows. Uh -huh. um, and it doesn't seem that the arbor speaks to the appropriate 
type of trimming. Mm. Um, and it, could you clarify, is the arbor saying that branch removal is the appropriate way to do it? And it didn't sound like it was, or that branch trimming the tips of the branches is the appropriate way to do it, and it was not done that way. Is that? <laughs> I, I don't know exactly uh, the specific way that was um, recommended. Um, there was a specific regimen that was discussed between the arborist and Lewis Tree Service um, that in which he established that um, done properly, whatever that entails with tipping, um, would maintain the tree for the next eight to 10 years. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I could add to this. I spoke to the arborist James Allen yesterday it, just to, and asked a similar question. And his advice was to uh, tree tipping or to trim the ends of the tree in order, branches in order to decrease the weight of the actual branches. So rather than removing single branches, the whole branch, his suggestion was to trim them to take off some of the weight. Okay. So just Thank to you. clarify. Thank you. Councilwoman, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, so the trimming that took place in 2012, I believe it, I believe it was, was that um, done based off of the direction of council in 2012? Was that something, so they did that on their own? Um, and that was the same year that they applied for the removal of the tree then? It's from what I... I'm not sure, I'd have to look back and check. Okay. That, might be, uh, they, that might be a better question for them when they come up. Okay. Okay, that's all I have for now. Yes, thanks. Council Member Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, so when I look at the picture here, and I've gone out and inspected the tree about three times. Uh, the last was today, and I did talk to the owner. Um, it seems like the tree is out of balance. So on the side, not on the property owner's side, but on the adjacent uh, owner's side, mm -hmm. it's weighted over to that side. Um, have a little concern about that. Um, I think the branches that broke off were on the property owner's side from what I could observe, but I wasn't there, so, and I didn't do, I mean, I wasn't there when the branches broke, um, but the picture clearly showed that it damaged the, um, the fence, I think, between, and you could see the damage, I could see the damage. So I'm questioning, um, where did the branches fall off? Or do we have a sense it's on the property owner's side? Um, there's complaints from the owner uh, neighbor that they're worried, you know, is, uh, their dog and, you know, if they're out there. So I'm wondering where that occurred. Um, I noted that the, um, one of the places where a branch broke off, there was a new branch forming, which sounds very healthy, might contribute to rebalancing the tree. Um, did, did the arborist detail where all the branches fell? Do we have a sense of where they fell? And if it's just on one side of the tree, that's sort of making me wonder why. I, I don't believe that. that might be another better question for the uh, appellant when they get up as to the branch okay. fall locations. Yeah. And then the issue of the tree looking on balance makes me concerned. You know, maybe work was done on one side because that's where the owner's house was, but not on the other side because it's on the adjacent uh, property and they didn't feel they could get there. So I'm wondering about that. Maybe that can be addressed when the appellant talks. I have no questions. All right. Um, having considered council's questions, uh, we're going to move on. Would it be, uh, could we get staff uh, advice here? Would it be appropriate to allow the appellant first to uh, speak to council before we go to general public comment? Okay. Uh, if the appellants would like to address the council at this time. Uh, let's see, we're going to have five minutes for um, comments from the appellants. If we could set the timer. Is it possible to get the screen up here? The computer up here? Um, I think you'll, the, that's the one that um, Mr. Cool. Yeah, that's the one I, I'll, I'll have to get. Can I um, lift it up here? Larry, can you put uh, it on the podium? Can we get the extra mat? So you can just do it on your own. Could they long but no, he wants to know if you can put it on the podium. I don't know if there's I don't think it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Not. Okay. I, I yeah. never present from there. Forgive me. Okay. Um, I appreciate the time you provided to hear the appeal as well as the time you spent reviewing the material I've spent as well as the, the registered forestry uh, professional as well as your own arborist. I'd like to start the presentation at the end of it actually. 
by uh, the closing paragraph of the second letter that Mike Janai, our registered professional forester, wrote. Then it says, in closing, I want to reiterate my concern that attempting to culture this tree's risk is not a sufficient or feasible way to protect the safety of the Olivers or their neighbors, nor will it reduce a very real and large liability. I hope that the information I've, ac I've additionally provided you may help to clarify those risks. Um, we've gone over the branch failures. We've had four. One in February was uh, not so sufficient. Uh, I want to skip this for time, but uh, Mr. Denai's qualifications are he's a chief forester of 400,000 acres of redwoods, half of all of California redwoods. He's worked for Big Creek for decades. He's worked in the business for 45 years, and he was appointed to California State Board of Forestry by both Governors Brown and Newsom. He knows his redwood trees. They both, you went over both of uh, what they've agreed to. Uh, the, the really important part of this tree is that they both agree that there's a genetic difference to this tree over most. Uh, coastal redwoods. And it causes uniquely long and large in diameter branches prone to failure. Uh, branch failure will continue. They both have stated they agree with that and the, the holes in the canopy. And we did do previous branching and pruning and branch reduction throughout the whole tree. So you're, you can talk about that later. Uh, so the important part is it will continue to uh, re uh, fail. Branches will continue to fail. Here's the canopy, the sprout that, uh, that the former Mayor Batron was talking about is in the center. These are, uh, Mike, uh, Mr. Janai also pointed out that there's a uh, reduction in the girth of the, uh, of the tree at about 40 feet, probably due to foundation or street work. Uh, it may cause other failures. Uh, the city arborist, because he didn't talk to us, um, and said there was only one broken tree on the March 13th event. There were actually, because I felt this was an emergency situation and I called Lewis Tree first, then came to the city and asked if we could do it, an emergency removal. Um, I had Lewis Tree take the seven branches that fell off away, as well as uh, seven branches in the tree. The one that's really critical here, although the red arrows in here show you where the ones on this side had, had fallen and were still in trees. There's one that's just above the roots, the arrow to the left side, and there's a light opening there, thick going down. That's a seven inch branch of about 30 feet long hanging over the sidewalk. Um, I'd like to show you the video of this, but it doesn't seem to be wanting coming up. <coughs> Is there a way to get this up? Please. Try clicking on the image itself. Oh, clicking on it. And then you'll get the ah, scroll at the bottom. Oh, it's tilted, unfortunately. All right. And there's, and there's volume that's not there. So I'm walking under this tree, showing you this. This was the March 13th failure, and there's no wind. There's very little wind at this mm -hmm. time when this tree failed. These branches, seven branches all came down on our neighbor's side from their side of the tree. Seven branches. Not a big storm event, done, gone. Here's the November 26th branch that came down. Uh, we all know it was very windy that night. Uh, this tree had been tipped. This, I mean, this branch had been tipped. It flew, the base through flew 20 feet. The tip, because it was probably on the left side where the wind was coming through, it flew 40 feet. So the branch is flying about 40 feet. And this is a huge tree. It's uh, probably about 300 pounds, 24 feet long, getting thrown around like it was nothing. Um, this is shows where it was tipped, and uh, six years ago it's grown back, it gets weighted at the end, prone to break, which is what uh, Mike Janai said would happen and why he doesn't believe that um, the pruning will work. Tip. Yeah, the tipping will work. Uh, Mike Janai believes that uh, this particular tree, due to genetics and growth conditions, is unsafe in its location, will continue to have branch failure. Strenuously opposes branch reduction on this tree due to the increase in long-term potential for branch failure, the end weighting issue. And just, just, for you, just so you know, I have to go up four and six times a year on the roof, which is not always safe either. Uh, I'm getting older, and I, I really am getting maybe a little less risk tolerant. 
Um, what does a prudent and reasonable person do? Follow the advice of an expert on redwood trees, recognize the danger posed by the unique tree with unusually and uniquely large branches. Mike Chennai does not, I'm gone, Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Um, I really don't have a lot to add. We've been doing this since 2012 when our neighbors, when we moved in, one of the first thing they asked us to do was do something about this tree. We're like, okay, wh what do you mean? We came to the city, they said no. We said, okay, we went to tree, Lewis Tree Service and did the trimming, did the pruning what's being recommended now. And last year we had storms that finally came through our community and the branches were falling down. I think that we as citizens of the city and homeowners have a right to feel safe in our home. I think our neighbors have a right to feel safe in their home, in their front yard. They don't have a backyard. They don't have a garage. The time they spend is always in the front of the, um, their home. And it's not okay to, if it's a little windy, don't go outside. When on the November the 26th, we called them when the branch came down, hit our house. We said, Robert, Missy, we just had a large branch come down, be careful. They came over and they said, yeah, we had guests over for dinner. We asked, where did they park? I said, they parked you know, right in front of our house. They said, no, 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 you can't park there because we don't know what that tree is going to do. Huge branch came down. Thank you. We'll yeah. answer questions. Does thank you for extending our time without making us feel like beeping at me. <laughs> <laughs> I only had 30 seconds. I have no questions. No questions? Councilmember Picard? So um, I was interested in the reduction in diameter that was pointed out during the Cheney report. And oh, hmm. how clear is that? It's clear. I mean, he, he did. Well, let's, let me say it again. Uh, he has gone there multiple times at this point, all on his own, much like you have. He's, you know, he, we didn't know Mike Janine. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a very circum, you know, just happenstance uh, meeting with him. And uh, he, yeah, so he's been over there three or four or five times. And the last time, I think with the, he just saw the, this, cause the opening seems to be bigger for some reason. I, I don't think things have fallen, but it just seems maybe the way branches are, more weighted now with the growth, it just seems more open than it was. And so you could really see it, it's about 40 feet up and it goes down probably about a foot at least in, in uh, diameter, yeah. Over about, I don't know, maybe six feet, seven feet. Well, to, you know, a little experience with redwood trees and I don't normally see that kind of change in diameter. I've seen them on Doug firs and, and other, maybe pines even but not on fir, I mean, excuse me, not on redwood trees. Did he comment on that? He did. In his second letter, he, he, he says there are several things that could have done it, all of which have happened. The construction of the home <laughs> and the cutting of all the roots around it. Uh, the work on the tree, which would have probably severed the roots and the sidewalk that was put in in 94 as well. So, um, you know, the, there's not a continuous sidewalk there. So I'm sure that that sidewalk was put in when uh, Lynn Dickey built that house in 94. Right. So that would have cut that side of the redwood tree roots. Right. Yeah. So he felt that was a weakness. That he thought that potentially it was a place for breakage. Yeah. <laughs> or at least that's what it seemed to imply in his letter from me. Okay. And is that the spot where, you know, because I. This is where all these trees are, uh, all, where all the failures are happening. Right at that spot. Right at that spot. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a question that I asked earlier. Um, so why is the tree weighted more on your neighbor's side? What, yeah, what's we, that I, about? I think why is that you saw that our house is in close proximity to the tree yes. and it was overhanging so when they tipped almost every single branch in 2012 um, they took out some but they also tipped all the remaining branches almost it's very obvious by the way if you look and so they took more off our side because of that because they were over our house. Okay, they concentrated there. Well, they, yeah, well, it was just, yeah, it, it wasn't, and we did some on the other side. It's just that it was, it's, our house is only 11 feet from the trunk of the redwood tree. So the canopy was well over, it was like 20 feet, the trees were, the branches were going 20 feet over our, our house. Vice Mayor Burke, any questions? Yeah, I just have one. Um, 
after the pruning took place in 2012, was there a recommendation to prune in the last seven years from then to now? Was that? Well, the co I, well, let me see. I, I don't know. There, we spent $2,300. In 2012? In 2000, well, thir 12, 13, 13. It was around there. I forget when it was. It was around there. Mm -hmm. When we first moved in, it was 2012, and our neighbors um, asked us because this tree w had not been maintained at all. The, the branches were 40 or 50 feet long. They were over the tree into the street, I mean, over the sidewalk into the street growing. Literally, they were touching the ground. And so, and they told us about the branch failures. Mm -hmm. We didn't know because it was summer. And so we asked the city, the city said no. And so we hired Lewis Tree Service, Mike Hernandez, the arborist, who is a certified arborist, just like James Allen. And he was in charge of pruning, tipping the tree appropriately. And as far as we knew, the $2,300 did it. This tree grows extremely fast because it has been topped. And so then all the growth happens at the branch level below it. And that's part of the problem. These branches are huge. Some of these uh, branches are 14 inches in diameter. Right. They're, they're, they're you know, good size law trees. And so. Um, Let me ask this a different way. How often, and I don't know if you know this, where I'm, um, how often is one required to tip the, the like, is this a process? Apparently sooner than six years. Six, okay. Well, apparently sooner. Yeah, let's say, yeah, no, I let's hear Let's say you. four. To, if, right. if, I mean, and I don't know if it's going to work, honestly. So, yeah. but let's say every four years, 2,300 bucks. Okay. Katie, do you? I can tip it every three years. Take 25% of the tree every 20, every. At $2,300 every three years yeah, so or so. Mm -hmm. So James Allen, I when I spoke with him yesterday, he said his recommendation would be probably every eight to ten years on tipping. Uh, so that's so that story. doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> that <laughs> doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Was that the extent that was, of your yeah, question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Council Member Story, do you have any questions? Can no, I, no sorry, questions. Can I expound on that reply by James Allen <coughs> for a second? Uh, recommendation from staff or city attorney? <coughs> additional time? I think it's your discretion. Yeah. Uh, one minute, please. Oh, this won't take one minute. So um, he showed other, in his uh, letter, he showed other redwoods in the area in Santa Cruz. And he said, oh, every eight to ten years you can tip it. It just it looks out just fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Well, this tree is in a position on the marine headland of Capitola where redwoods don't grow. The other trees are further back. They don't get the salinity burn. They don't get the winds that we experience. And so the and this tree is, as I say, genetically larger than all these other trees he's talking about. So eight to ten years isn't going to work. So you're asking me if I were, if you're going to say no, we're not going to take it down. Uh, Twenty three. It's probably be about a thousand dollars a year maintenance for me okay. for the rest of. Thank you, Councilmember Story. Do you have any questions? No questions. Okay, I just have some some quick questions, and it's in line with uh, what Vice Mayor Brooks had asked. So if I'm understanding correctly. There was a tree trimming in twenty in twenty twelve. Yeah, late um, twenty thirteen, right around there. Uh, 2012, 2013, uh, after the incident, where where so there, there were no right? incidences no. then. There was not a fall well, in twenty thirteen. Our neighbors said that there had been incidences. <laughs> okay. And Passed. the tree was just a mess. So and then something there was, had to be done. And then between twenty twelve and twenty nineteen, there were there were no incidences of a failure. No, that's not true. Well, no, two thousand six was there. No, no, no. All no, no, of no, those pictures were from twenty nineteen. Yeah. No, no, that's not true. It's just that they they weren't to this magnitude. So there have been branch failures, mm -hmm. uh, just not to this magnitude, and the size of these is just, yeah, but but yes, there have been fa branch failures. Okay. All pure, all the, all, every year there's been branch failures. And is there an indication of the cost to remove the tree? Uh, yes. $7,000. I, I mean, I'd like to go to Big Creek and see if they can have the tree and take it away from me for nothing, but I don't know if they're going to do that. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's all the questions from the council. We thank you uh, for for uh, presenting that to us. Uh, at that time, uh, if there are any other members of the public that would like to address the co the council on this matter, now would be the time. Hi. Welcome. Hi. I'm uh, Robert Briganti. I'm Mike's neighbor at 4910 <laughs> Capitol Road. Um, this is my wife, Missy. We live underneath the tree pretty much in our front yard, as you can see by the pictures. Um, most 
of the branch mm -hmm. failures have been falling onto our property. And when you saw the pictures of the branches over the fence, those were actually on top of our garbage cans. And one of those branches fell about five minutes after my wife took out the garbage. So it's really a safety issue for us. Like Mike also said, when we had friends over the other night, we had to make sure nobody parked in our driveway. We had to go park down the street in case a branch fell. And then later that night, the branch did fall. It fell onto Mike's house, but still it's, you're always wondering when there's a storm, rain, winds, even light winds, if a branch is gonna fall on you. And it's not like, you know, a little branch on a little tree in your backyard. These branches could be considered trees by themselves. They're that large. And that's all. Thank you. Any other member of the public that would like to address the council on this issue? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for deliberation. We'll start uh, with Council Member Bottorf. Thanks. Um, thank you for uh, coming in and uh, presenting your case on the tree. Um, there's a, uh, the, the findings that we are, you know, given guidelines to, uh, to come up with here are, are pretty substantial. But uh, when I look at the pictures uh, and, and when I did uh, the site inspection of looking at the tree, uh, a couple things were obvious to me. Uh, one, the tree's a hazard. Two, the tree's a nuisance. And three, it's inevitable that uh, sometime more branches are going to fall and, and now we're just playing roulette with whether somebody's going to get hurt. Um, there was a comment in the letter that said trees like this belong in the forest and that's what I believe. Um, we've had problems with redwood trees close proximity to houses, to lifting their roots. You know, the, the, we love redwood trees. It's part of California, but they belong in remote areas where we can enjoy them. Uh, and this one is not in that proximity. <clears throat> I believe that the pruning, the topping of the tree caused some other effects to that tree. The first effect is it, it makes it look hideous. Uh, the tipping will continue to do things like that. And what we're trying to do is shove 10 pounds of tree in a five pound bag and it's not gonna work. This, this tree is just not, it doesn't have the shape of a tree. It doesn't, pres doesn't pose any benefit to the community as far as I'm concerned. In fact, I'm pretty adamant that it promotes a safety hazard. We just got done closing a, uh, a well-walked path on Depot Hill because we were fearful of, of uh, residents being exposed to hazards that we couldn't predict. Trying to predict the fall of a seawall is trying to predict the fall of a branch. So uh, I'm completely convinced and I find findings under safety that this, uh, uh, I would um, go against the staff recommendation and uh, allow the uh, uh, applicants to, to uh, remove the tree. Councilmember Patron. So the staff followed our rules and regulations in this regard and uh, thank you for doing the job. I think um, according to what the arbor said, uh, you came to the correct conclusion. Um, I was sitting, I was in Boulder Creek and uh, basically our property was two lots and a lot of redwood trees and I was just sitting out on the redwood trees reading a book by the, uh, the river and I happened to get up because I wanted to get a drink or something like that and um, as I started to walk away, I heard the crack, not knowing what it was, but it was the crack of a branch. And as I turned away, the branch fell a couple of feet away from where I was. My foot could have been impaled. Um, so it's not an unusual circumstance in a forest that things do fall. Um, we did have a tree topped on our property. It was a dug fir and the branches did grow out further and they appeared to be much larger in diameter because that's the only place where the growth could go. And I think that's what happened with this particular tree. I think the trees were designed to hold a certain weight, but if the growth is no longer able to go high, then the weight is distributed and the growth is distributed to the branches. And that's probably why these branches are failing. So I feel that the past treatment of this tree has led to the current problem and I'm in support of cutting the tree down. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks. 
Um, was that a motion by Council I haven't Park? heard I any motion. I did not make a motion. Yet. Okay. Um, I'll, I am in agreement with uh, my counterparts here that this is a safety hazard and um, I would be going against the staff recommendation. Councilmember Story. Thank you. I think we're starting to see a trend here. Um, I, I just want to say, um, you know, trees are important to us. That's why we have this ordinance to make sure that only in appropriate circumstances are they taken down. Um, um, and I view this to be one of those appropriate circumstances. I don't think there's any question here that this uh, constitutes yep. a safety hazard. Um, uh, and as well as we've seen from the evidence, it has caused uh, unreasonable property damage. So the safety factors have been, element has been met in this situation. And in my view, the only question was, have all alternatives been uh, considered and applied to try to save the tree? Um, and, um, and it appears that, uh, and the issue is, it is about the trimming. Uh, and all the discussions about that has, you know, the topping that has created problems um, and even the tipping. Um, the arborist suggests, and, and also I'm, I mean, my decision is also way by, I, I'm unclear about what the arborist is saying is that reasonable alternative. Um, he doesn't clarify whether, I mean, I mean, he seems to be saying that tipping is what needs to be done, but we've just seen that the limbs that came down, they had already been tipped, um, and those limbs that came down were tipped. Um, and my experience with trees, that when you tip them, they tend to sprout at that very point, which is going to create uh, weight uh, at that end. So I don't see how that is going to solve this problem. Um, and I think that when we're faced with a potential safety situation, it's not a incumbent upon the city to tell residents to bear that risk. Um, um, and uh, I think the, the case has been made. Um, and I, you, you know, and, I, and this is also an environment where we're PG&E because of reoccurring um, wind uh, conditions have been shutting off our power in terms of safety so that trees don't come down um, and break power lines. Um, so I think that we're in an era of atypical storms. Um, and um, and I, I just, I, I don't in good conscience uh, think I can um, say to the residents and the neighbors that live there that you can't take appropriate actions for your own sense of not only your actual safety, but your also sense of safety. Uh, because sometimes if you don't feel safe, you're not safe whether you really are or not. And so, um, you know, and I think for all those reasons, um, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, grant the uh, applicant's appeal um, and, um, and, and give them a, a permit to take down the tree subject to uh, our ordinance saying that you have to replace uh, that tree with, uh, you know, ap appropriate other trees um, for the, for your um, um, uh, residents. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to <coughs> if there's not 30% canopy coverage on the lot, you need to replace it to two to one ratio. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll second. So. I, I'd like to make a friendly amendment if you'd, if you'd allow. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I'm, I feel that this, this uh, <coughs> homeowner has been through a lot of duress with this project. I, I would have liked to have seen this handled at the Planning Commission level. Uh, I, I would like to make a friendly amendment that their appeal fee be refunded to them for coming to the City Council. Um, I accept that. I agree. A friendly amendment. I was, if you weren't going to do that, I was going to do that because they've gone through a lot. <laughs> so. All right. We have a motion and a second. I have a comment to make. Okay, uh, 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds. Um, I'd like to reiterate uh, what was in the appellant's letter in terms of they try to make this front of the house a rather nice place, even under the tree. So um, they're trying to make that a sense of a sense of beauty around there, and I recognize that. And because of that, I recognize that they've done a lot also to try to keep this tree. Um, it's had an important part of their life and the, the property there. So I don't think you're taking this lightheartedly. I think this is a serious decision on your part, and I just want to recognize that. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move on to item 10B, report on emergency declaration from December 3rd, 2019. Staff report. Hi, Steve. Good evening, Mayor and Council. A uh, quick report here on some emergency actions we had to take following the uh, heavy rains over the Thanksgiving weekend. And I think I'm just going to start with a bunch of pictures because I think that tells the story better than anything. On December 2nd, which was the Monday following Thanksgiving weekend, um, over that weekend we had seven inches of rainfall. We had rain following on December 2nd. And we got a report of this damaged pathway along Grand Avenue. This is in a section that in 2017 the council had closed because of um, ongoing slope failures in this area had actually reduced the uh, pathway, the failures that had occurred right up to the fence line at this point. So we had anticipated, we hired a geologist back in 2017 who told us further failure was imminent in this area. He predicted some point in the next five years. Uh, two years was the right number. So um, this failed, this pathway was closed already. Um, but the thing to notice here is the runoff, which used to travel along this pathway, was now dumping into this open hole. And if we look at the aerials here, this is the pathway that picture before was taken from this side. So all that runoff was coming down here and you can see the accelerated erosion it was causing uh, in, in the slip out area. And just a quick uh, thank you to Misa, Misha Birch and Dave Friday, who uh, have been our drone pilots and provided me with uh, lots of drone footage of this failure and other parts of Depot Hill. Unfortunately, their photos have all been mixed up, so I'm not exactly sure who's or who's anymore, but uh, thanks to both of them for uh, helping us out here. Um, so this map, a little harder to see here than I was hoping, but as you can see, these yellow lines are where the drainage used to go. So the um, drainage would come down Hollister, then travel along that pathway past where the hole is now and into a drainage inlet that had an outfall down on the bluffs. So with the, obviously with the <coughs> failure here, that drainage was dumping into the hill. So what um, we did is we hired a contractor come in and install a clean out or a drainage inlet and outfall at Hollister intercepting probably 95, 96% of the flow that was going down that pathway to prevent further erosion just caused by the, the discharge of water into that hole. So here's the contractor we hired starting work. It was all hand dug at this point because we didn't want to use heavy equipment out there. You can see they tied themselves off to a, heavy to a backhoe just in case the cliff decided to give way. Uh, they were very, very diligent. Uh, they started work on December 4th, and by December 6th, prior to any more rains come, they had completed this new inlet. They did this paving to make sure that all of the flows in this area drained into this inlet, including a berm here to prevent flows from going down the pathway or over the cliff face. And here's another aerial from our drone pilots, and you can see this black pipe coming down here. The key to these pipes are from, I think this is the level, um, up to here we have loose uh, topsoil, probably a better name for it, but topsoil that's highly erodible. And below this point we have sandstone, which is um, subject to waves, but it's, it's not affected by the runoff. So it's important that we extend this outfall down into the sandstone area, which you can see we did here. So <coughs> just to kind of recap, on December 3rd, uh, following the discovery on December 2nd, the City Emergency Services Director, also known as our City Manager, issued a local emergency proclamation authorizing immediate actions to abate the flow of water into the failed slope. On December 4th, a contract was awarded to Anderson Pacific Engineering Contractors for the construction of the drain inlet and outfall at the end of Hollister Avenue. Anderson Pacific completed the work on December 6th. And we do not have a final cost, but it's somewhere in the $20,000 range at the cost of the project. So our recommendations tonight are to receive this report and to authorize the expenditure of measure F, measure F funds within the Capital Improvement Program Fund for this emergency work. And just to kind of update you on there, currently there's about over a million dollars in Measure F funds in the Capital Improvement Program. 
these uh, Measure F funds are earmarked for ocean resiliency projects. Um, the two that we're working on actively is the Flume and Jetty Project and the Wharf Project. We have sufficient f money for the Flume and Jetty Project, which we anticipate going out to bid in 2020. The Wharf Project is still a couple of years away by the time we get it permitted. And in either case, the ex estimated $20,000 expense for this emergency pair will not impact either of these projects. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Council Member Baca? Yeah, there, there was a letter we received from the Coastal Commission. Um, do, is that able to be, I know it was in our packet, is that able to be pulled up? Do, was there a letter that we got from the Commission about this? Yeah, I don't have it to present on the screen. Oh. I'm sorry. I could put it up on the screen in a okay. second. I'm concerned about the comments in there from the Coastal Commission to us. Um, I don't have a letter in front of me right now, so I can't remember what they were. And if I see the letter, it's, it's going to okay. take me a minute. Unfortunately, should we come back to you? Yeah, we'll yeah, we can. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll prompt the letter. Unless, unless you have the same concerns. I, I, I do. I was going to ask those questions. Then you know what? I'm going to defer to Councilman Story, and he can carry this ball. And I, I have the letter on my phone here. Okay, good. Um, and, and maybe I, I, I could just um, ask uh, Steve uh, okay. each question that the Coastal Commission brings up. Um, the first item that they bring up is that they want that or they I think they're recommending that the uh, asphalt that's remaining uh, in that area the wooden the fence the parts of it that fell um, they're um, suggesting that those be removed um, is that a feasible project to do is that and worth the effort I certainly have safety concerns with Absolutely. putting people out in that area. Yeah. I've talked to the, co the Coastal Commission staff who wrote the letter, and she understands that. Okay. She would like us to make a, a, a best effort at doing that, but understands that there's safety concerns with going in and working in that area. Okay. Um, well, I would certainly, I mean, if there was any intent to move in that direction, uh, maybe that should be brought back to us so that we can seriously discuss that. The other items that they mentioned, uh, there were three of them, um, and one is examining what level of storm, 10-year, 20-year, the current uh, drainage would accommodate uh, was one question. Um, and also, number two was to consider any other additional drainage um, uh, efforts uh, up on Depot Hill uh, to prevent uh, further um, uh, collapses of the bluff. And the third one was the feasibility of reclaiming uh, the um, public right-of-way uh, that moves into, uh, I think, some of those uh, residents' uh, current backyards. Um, so those were the points that the Coastal Commission raised. And I'm just wondering if staff was prepared to respond to them now or whether you was planning on maybe bringing this back at a later date. So those are responses that will go with our um, when the coastal permit goes to the Planning Commission is when we need to have those responses. I do not have prepared responses oh. for them at this time. Um, obviously, the determining the capacity of the drain inlet takes a little bit of topographical information to figure out how big an area we're draining and, and some engineering calculations. So I haven't done that. Um, regarding reestablishing the footpath and reclaiming our right of way. Um, my recommendation would be that the council continue to keep it closed. Um, I don't feel like that's an area. Right now, the failures are probably within a foot of the property lines um, in certain areas, so there's no room without starting to um, try and claim private property with, to reopen that pathway, and we can reiterate that as part of a report when it goes to the Planning Commission. And third item, can you remind me what the third item was? Well, actually, the reclaiming was the third item, but but the second item okay. was ab about uh, evaluating whether um, drainage projects on other parts of the cliff should be done right. to prevent failures in other locations. Thank you for reminding me. Um, certainly, we've done um, some drainage calculations drainage studies up on um, Depot Hill um, probably about 10 years ago and looked at ways to capture all the street drainage and take it away from the bluff. Um, that's a multi-million dollar project and then you know, take all the drainage and take it down to Monterey Avenue. Um, so it really hasn't gotten much, 
headway because of, of the significance. You'd be building an entire new drainage system up there on Depot Hill. We did work with the Geological Hazard Abatement District who had um, hired somebody to look at what the best way to deal um, short term with the drainages up there. They're the ones that came up with that design of the Owl Falls going down to the, the sandstone down there. Um, so we, when that study came out, we did go in and re refurbish the existing drainage inlets at that time to put that kind of system in, and we've been maintaining that sy type of system on the other ones. Um, certainly we can look at it, but you know, doing an extensive uh, drainage improvement project up there is, is very expensive. So y you mentioned that you were going to respond to the Coastal Commission when you uh, make the permit application. Will that be coming back to us before that goes off? So the Coastal Development Permit is issued by the Planning Commission. It can get appealed to the Council, or we could certainly bring a ba report back if that's what you would like. Uh, but the permit itself would be issued at the Planning Commission level. Okay, and so the responses to those Coastal Commission um, questions uh, and statements are going to go to the Planning Commission and they will deal with it. Go ahead. I think the responses would go to the Planning Commission. Any obligation that becomes a city obligation, in other words, in something that would result in us incurring new costs or embarking on a new program, that would come to the City Council. So that's not something the Planning Commission could, for example, commit us to a drainage master plan for the Depot Hill community. Um, that would need to come to the Council. So. I think that we have been looking at a lot of these things and having these conversations with the Coastal Commission for a number of years, and we see things a little bit differently than they do. So I think most of the responses we will be providing them in, in, the, um, in the CDP will be explaining to them why what they're asking for is relatively infeasible. Obviously, if there's something we can do to, to accommodate one of their asks, mm -hmm. we'll identify that. But if it does result in a new expenditure or program, that would go to the council. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the estimated costs you said were about twenty thousand um, dollars. The work was completed on the sixth, the nineteenth. Now, is there any updates on that? Unfortunately, no. no. It takes them a while to get all their billing together and trucking and concept consultants that they use. So. Okay, and then um, so this this fix is somewhat of a short term fix, and kind of what the Coastal Commission is saying was an idea for a long-term solution. Are there any other solutions we looked at at this time? So I consider this, like I said, the design of this type of outfall was something that had been promoted um, along Grand Avenue. Um, there are no active projects to try and do any other drainage improvements up there at this point. We can mm -hmm. certainly talk about that as we look at our CIP and funding. Like we, like I said, about a decade ago, we did do a drainage study that identified what to do, but the costs are quite prohibitive. Okay, and then just to reiterate, the measure funds are not restricted funds and can be used on ocean resiliency projects. Is that the yeah, term? Yeah, measure F funds are general fund dollars. Um, we just identify them as measure F because they were, when that measure was passed, we kind of earmark them for ocean resiliency projects and other necessary city functions, so. Okay, and have we, has there been any direct impact on the residents who live right there? I mean, obviously there has been, but is there any anything that the city is doing to talk with them or um, do we need to be worried about them legally on the ways that we're handling these? So these one of the neighbors uh, most near the out, um, Slope failure has installed a plastic sheeting over the area, and I've talked with him. Um, he has concerns um, about the safety of the rest of his property. Yeah. Um, and I've shared with him that you know, um, any small things or, or media things we can do, uh, we would look at, but um, ultimately the protection of that is gonna fall to the property owners um, as it becomes to impact their private property. So I'm hearing that this is it for now, and we don't have a timeline on dealing with it in the future, in the near future. There's no direction um, to do any other additional work at that time up in Depot Hill. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councilor Breton. Um, so when the study was done uh, with the uh, Jihad group and the drains were identified as options, okay. Um, so are they designed for worst case flows? 
No, it was more of a function of um, the existing pipes that we could fit into the existing systems to extend them. So the old DIs used to just daylight out on the buff slope itself and erode that highly erodible topsoil material. So this was a um, something we could fit into the existing system. They are not designed. I don't know what year storm they're designed for. I suspect it's somewhere between a 10 and a 20 year storm. Um, but what will result is localized ponding up on those streets until they empty. Um, it's not something where they're going to flood. Um, in a 100 year storm, there's going to be a lot of flooding, but uh, uh, they're certainly not designed for that. Okay, yeah, because my concern is, you know, can the outflow handle a worst case scenario and what would happen to the water? You're saying it would flood to, s I mean, excuse me, it would puddle to some extent, but it might spill over the edge too. That is possible on a big enough storm, yes. Okay. Um, I did do a tour of the Balajit's property at the end where, where that little bed and breakfast hotel type thing is. And their, ad their attempt to address that situation was they planted the side of the hill. And, you know, I got a sort of a over the view top um, look and he hasn't complained of any erosion since then after his plants started growing. I don't know if that's a solution for this case. Councilman Rubatroff, any questions? No. No? Okay. Uh, is there any member of the public that would like to address us on this matter? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council for deliberation. Comments. Comments. Okay. <laughs> Th thanks for filling in the pieces there, Councilman Story. Yeah, th um, I've got this letter from the Coastal Commission. It was quite alarming to me. Uh, the city manager put it m more eloquently than I would. To say that we uh, don't see eye to eye with the Coastal Commission is an understatement. Um, for trying to do things, I, I believe I'd like to try to do things for our bluff, to preserve our bluff for our, for our citizens, for our uh, homeowners, uh, for those that like to use public as access, which is what the Co Coastal Commission um, uh, purportedly advertised that that's their goal. Um, what they wrote in this letter is, this is the comment, uh, as Councilman Story said there were three, but the one I was focusing on was it said, examine the feasibility of reclaiming the public right of way to allow for a through public pathway, even if such path could only exist for a relatively short planning horizon, five to 20 years. You know, we, we're trying to do projects in this county. We're trying to protect our county for the future. To If you talk, talk we're going to get a presentation a little bit later about long-term water planning for 100 years. And to suggest that we want to do something for five years is ludicrous. Um, we, we People on that path, when it fell, thought that uh, it was going to be stable for five or 10 years, and we needed to reopen it immediately. And here we are, less than two years later, it, it fell back into the ocean. Um, what we need is, is uh, some kind of a commitment for the Coastal Commission that we want to address how we're going to save our bluff permanently. So the letter I would like to see the city write to the Coastal Commission if we're going to do such a thing, and I'm not saying that we need to do it here, but if there's any way that we respond, they say they would like us, they're asking us to respond to them, we encourage you to re recommend us, is that Capitol is looking for a long-term solution. And I, I recently gave the city manager some information about a seawall trail that was built in Carlsbad. It's called the Carlsbad Seawall Trail, which you can look up uh, on the internet. And they uh, built a 16 foot high, 1.4 mile pathway, 10 feet wide, all along the act that allows public access, which is supposed to be the intention of the, uh, of the Coastal Commission, and would fit perfectly into Capitola in that situation and, and probably lead to solving our problem. And the reason I bring it up is that we're in constant communication with the uh, Coastal Commission, and part of the uh, we're trying to we're, we're trying to adopt our LCP. Is that correct? Yes. And um, recently, uh, Santa Cruz was just trying to adopt their LCP, and they halted it because they inserted some language that they put in at the last minute that says that as part of the, the Coastal Commission accepting their LCP, that uh, they would. Uh, be allowed to build a Carlsbad Sea Trail from, from downtown Santa Cruz to 41st Avenue. And I think that when we get to that point, when we start getting back on that, uh, that we should include some kind of language in that too. So I'm, I'm just kind of put off by the, by the Coastal Commission demanding that we do this in response to this small fall. And, and the problem is, is that although 
it was a very good repair we did there. It's a Band-Aid, Steve, is what we did. It, 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 we stopped a, a, a situation that could have got a lot worse because of the eroding. But, you know, we're pretty much helpless with what we're doing there. And, and I, just, I just want us to write a letter that has a little bit more uh, oomph in it than, than what they're requesting here. Um, and, and that kind of segued off of what the topic is. But the topic is, is this is an approval for the uh, use of Measure F funds. And I make a motion that we uh, approve staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. We'll bring it back to staff for continued uh, discussion. Councilmember Botsworth. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Councilmember Bertrand. Vice Mayor Brooks. Councilmember Stewart. If I may, I'd just like to thank the city staff and Steve Public Works for getting out there so quickly, um, and uh, with uh, for Anderson Pacific, th thanking them uh, because it was truly m remarkable how quickly you guys out there and, and dealt with that. Um, and able to maybe forestall any further uh, damage to it. Um, now, I don't, you know, we have now plastic flapping around up there. Um, and I'm not sure quite what good it's doing other than maybe eventually falling into the ocean. Um, so uh, hopefully we could maybe uh, either find a way to secure it um, or maybe remove it or and find some other alternative. Um, and maybe just thinking about, um, and you know, for the residents up there about uh, uh, doing some planting uh, and vegetation. Um, seems like that, you know, maybe that's the um, affordable and reasonable thing to maybe try to do at this stage. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will just make a comment briefly that uh, I agree with what was previously mentioned about the comments from the Coastal Commission. It's rather concerning that they would. Um, be expecting us to reopen the path, especially um, in, in looking at the pictures. Um, and, and I will say that I believe it was in 2017 um, when I and, and several of the residents up on that path uh, held kind of a, an ad hoc citizens working committee to look at the potential for very long-term solutions for preventing this from, from ever happening again. And it was multi-million dollars that included seawalls, drilling into uh, rock bolts, drilling into the, the wall, and, and we um, believed at that time also that the, the Coastal Commission would not approve something like that. And so the idea that we should now take up almost uh, the entire backyards of the, the citizens that live along that path to attempt to reopen it is, is quite concerning uh, and alarming to me to see that letter. Uh, so I echo my, my fellow council members' comments on that. Um, with that, there is a motion and a second uh, for the approval of the Measure F funds. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item <coughs> G, uh, excuse me, 10C, receive update report on the construction of the Capitola Branch Library. This is our uh, every other month update on the project uh, on Wharf Road, constructing a new library. So a quick uh, construction update, recently completed items included Installation of the roof trusses, waterproofing and rain, waterproofing of the roof and rain leaders. Uh, mechanical and electrical plumbing stub outs are being installed are installed throughout the building now, and winteriz winterization of the site was completed. Upcoming work includes uh, starting to install exterior siding materials and interior wall construction. Uh, to date, uh, can, looking at the construction costs, the current value of the uh, contract is $11,652,747. Um, this is an increase from our last report of $17,674 for a contract change order number four, which was issued per our policy, which allows us um, to issue change orders up to uh, $50,000 without council authorization. Uh, this was uh, a change order that cleaned up some of, uh, so there was some uh, unusable fill material that needed to be removed and some stormwater uh, investigation and work that needed to be done uh, as we got into the project. Um, to date, we have paid, or there's been expenses of $4,889,995. Uh, 
95% of that goes to contractor and 5% is held in with re retention will be released upon significant completion of the project. Uh, that constitutes 42% of the contract is now complete. Um, since the contract was awarded and construction began, we've had 85 days of rain that have extended the contract uh, timelines. Uh, we're in, in addition, we're beginning to f see and feel delays caused by the conflict with the power lines, which I can touch on a little bit here. Uh, the projected opening remains mid-summer of 2020. Um, that may begin to slip a little as we, depending on the, uh, how quickly we can address the conflict with the power lines. So I'll move right into that. Um, as you know, we are working to uh, underground the utilities, the uh, power and AT&T lines that run along Wharf Road that are in conflict with the building itself. Um, earlier this week, after waiting nearly six months, uh, pg e finally provided a design for their portion of the project. Uh, city staff reviewed it and uh, we immediately noted some emissions on their plan, which they are now working on. Uh, conduit installation. So pg e will come in and pull wires through conduits that we have to put in place and they'll place their equipment on pads that we pour. Um, so we are working on getting uh, costs for that work, uh, the conduit installation at this time. Um, we're talking with several uh, companies uh, to try and get um, some, I, I, I don't want to say we're bidding it out because it's going to be a change order to the library project, but we're trying to make sure we're paying the right amount for the conduit installation. And we also still need to get costs from AT&T uh, to pull their install their new equipment down below down uh, underground so we have not received those costs yet we anticipate getting the, all of this together uh, early in january um, at least that's our goal at this point since we have the pg e plans and now everybody can work off of um, and negotiations with the the architect and their design team on our errors and emissions claim will be will proceed in january and at, point, at that point when we have more information on the final cost and those negotiations we will return to council immediately and get uh, and fill you in and try and get some direction on how to proceed forward um on a little lighter note furniture selection did occur um, the architect uh, their interior design staff library staff the ad hoc design committee and City staff have completed selection of the furniture. Um, happy to report that furniture upgrades um, have been made possible by the success of the fundraising campaign. They've put in about, I think it's $20,000 to make sure we get um, the best furniture we can. Um, furniture will be s bidding in early 2020 so that we can get it purchased and delivered to coincide with the construction. Um, I know there's pictures in the uh, agenda report of all the furniture. I do not, I, I can pull them up if you're interested. They're not part of the report here, but if you'd like to see some of the pictures, I can pull those up. Um, and in this report, we kind of alternate between giving you a revenue update and an expenditure update. So this year, this month, we're giving you a revenue update. Um, the second call from the left is the original budget where we had a total of 50, Fifteen million one hundred and fifty thousand dollars budgeted uh, through various funds from Measure S, the successor agency general fund, donations, library fund. At the time we awarded the contract, we did have an unfunded portion of thirty-six thousand dollars, which we were very confident we could make up uh, as we move through the project. As you can see, since that time we have had changes. Um, some were pretty small. Um, others have been much better so successor agency went up in the general fund contribution those are more fixing rounding differences that were made and and doing the actual transfers um, big news is on December earlier in this month uh, the county board of supervisors approved an allocation from the county library funds which included a two hundred thirteen thousand three hundred thirty seven dollar allocation to our project this was not anticipated in the original budget, so we brought that in. And then the city treasurer um, was given authority to uh, invest in, in with our money that we have sitting uh, on this. So today we have in investment earnings of $130,000. That's to date. 
Um, he anticipates that to go up another twenty, thirty thousand dollars before we're done with this project. So those are uh, additional revenues that we hadn't anticipated when we originally awarded the contract. So as you can see from our original budget of fifteen million one hundred fifty thousand dollars, we've uh, added four hundred twenty thousand um, dollars, bring the available funds to. 15, 434, 3097. At this time, we're not recommending any budget changes. Um, the the but project budget remains at $15,150,000, uh, but we do have surplus funding as of today of $384,397. Some good news. That concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. There's no formal actions required tonight um, regarding the change orders or anything. Thank you. All right. I'm going to bring it back to the council for questions. Councilmember Rautor. Question. Uh, in addition to the 384000 that is, let's just call it for now, a surplus, how much is remaining in the contingency account? The contingency bu budget as of last month had $540,000 in it. Thank you. I assume PG&E has designed many underground projects. What were the issues that uh, our <laughs> staff discovered? They've got to account for three streetlights that are connected to their system. Their system, their streetlights. Their system, forgot. their streetlights. Okay, lights. thank you. Um, I went by today. There was some street work at the corner. Is this related? Or is the this street work there is actually a county sanitation project that has been going on when the okay. new pipeline that came from the SoCal pump station. They've run into a some significant design problem in making the connection from the new pipe to the old pipe. Um, which is why we've had plates and temporary asphalt out there. They've recently come to the decision that they will not be able to work on that for the remainder of this winter. <laughs> so they went out there and took out all the temporary paving and put in a permanent paving, but it's still just a patch and it's going to get redone. So um, we're kind of bewildered that they'd leave the street so torn up for so long and been after them to do something. So we finally got them to do some paving out there. Okay, great. So this will make it a little bit easier for residents. Are they going to take everything out or what? It'll, you know, clean the street up quite a bit. They'll be re removing their equipment, which has been stored there for quite a few months now. Um, but they will be back probably in the spring to, to kind of open it all up and, and make those final connections. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks, question? No question. Council Member Story, no question? Questions. All right, we'll bring it uh, out for any member of the public that would like to address us on this matter. Seeing none, uh, we'll bring it back to council. And since this is just a report, is there any comments on the report? I have one. Um, I know this isn't the extensive list of all the furniture. Um, and I just wanted, I've mentioned it before about going above and beyond the ADA requirements and really tapping into the universal design. And I know um, our city manager is on this committee. And if it's still going out to bid, maybe just revisiting that um, with them just looking at some of the uh, models here, it doesn't look like this is for all um, Yeah, I just gave you some bodies. examples, yes. But we, we'd be happy to review okay, that. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Any further comments from the council? All right, thank you. Thank you. We will move on to item 10D, receive audit report for fiscal year 2018-2019. Good evening, Mayor Peterson, Vice Mayor Brooks, and Council Members. Uh, as the Mayor just said, this is for the fiscal year 2018-19 uh, comprehensive financial um, uh, financial statements. And I have uh, Mr. Ahmed Garibal from, he is a partner with eBailey, who is our external auditors here to do a brief presentation on the process that they went through. Thank you for uh, having me. Just to confirm, I do have control over here for the PowerPoint presentation? You should, yeah. Okay. I, I do not see it on this screen, but I guess if I move the arrow over here, it should work. Oh, Jen, you have control. Oh, I have control. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmad Garaybe. I am the partner in charge of uh, the city. This is the annual financial report for the city. It's the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, we are the external auditors of the city. Uh, the scope of the audit is to ensure that the financial statements are fairly stated, 
um, it, we split the audit into three phases, the interim phase, the final phase, and then it's the reporting phase is what we call it towards the end. Uh, in the interim phase, we come in and we take a look at the controls, the manner that you process receipts, the manner that you process disbursements, uh, contracting, uh, payroll, HR, all kinds of functions. We want to see adherence to the city policies with respect to those items. Um, we do also test of uh, compliance as well and test of controls. Um, and then we come in at the, towards the final phase. It is a process in which we confirm the balances are reported to, uh, to you on these financial statements. They were reported to you previously. We are the auditors. We just come in as an affirmation that the amounts that were reported to you are fairly stated. And therefore, what we do is a process of confirmation. Uh, so we confirm your, your uh, cash, your debt, um, property taxes, sales tax revenue, various amounts that are reported on the financial statements. And then the last phase of the audit, uh, I'm sorry, we, we also do other procedures such as looking at uh, significant estimates. You do have pension liabilities and OPEB liabilities in common with many of the local governments that are out there. Um, and then the final phase would be the reporting phase. Um, this is the comprehensive annual financial report, so it adheres to government accounting standards board. It has specific st uh, reporting standards. In addition, the city does submit it to a, an agency called the Government Finance Officer Association. They review it in compliance with the reporting standards, the GASPI reporting standards that the city did receive it in 2019, uh, I'm sorry, 18, and we anticipate that they're going to receive it in 2019 as well. Uh, we are required to report to you whether we noted any uh, uh, difficulties, any weaknesses in the internal control, any difficulties in the performance of the audit or any adjustments to the financial statements that are material to the financial statements. And we noted none. Management has been very helpful um, in giving us the confirmation and connecting us with the uh, agencies that are in charge of the various amounts that are reported on your financial statements. And we were able to complete the audit rather early. And with that, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions from council? No? Very much. Um, we've significantly been able to achieve award status. <laughs> what do you feel in this case? This is good. Um, you know, the accounting industry in government had been drastically changing um, over the past, I want to say, four or five years. I don't know, Jim, we had like maybe 40 GASBs out of the 90 GASBs that were issued in the past five years. And um, I, I want to say, it, it uh, changed drastically. So the pension numbers weren't reported before. Now they are reported on the financial statements. Uh, retiree health, they call it other post-employment benefits. And the manner that these are calculated, they're rather difficult. They're, they're not, uh, it's, it's not as easy as it used to be. But again, uh, w w management had been very cooperative, very helpful, and um, you know, these, these financial statements do adhere to the accounting and reporting standards, and uh, they are fairly stated. Thank you. Commissioner Brooks? I have two questions. It's nothing more than better than I love than reading an audit from start to finish. <laughs> That's what I love to do on a Monday night. Um, two questions. Um, on, and this might be more for you, um, on page 324 of the audits, there was a significant reduction from 2018 to 19 um, on the miscellaneous intergovern intergovernmental and other revenues from 406,000 to 119,000, and that seems to be brand new in the 10-year span. Uh, yeah, so I think she's referring to page eight. Um, so these statements that you see here page eight on the CAFR. These statements that you see here are what they call full accrual financial statements. And they're a little different than the fund financial statements. And what's interesting in that CAFR is that the pension liability is not recorded in your general fund. It's recorded in this, what we call full accrual. It's a consolidation of all the funds alongside with these long-term numbers. 
And the change in the pension liabilities is what causes some of these fluxes that you see there in the financial statements. Bear it's with me while I catch up. On, on page eight is a breakdown of what I'm looking at yes. on page 324. Okay. And the line item you're looking at is? Miscellaneous revenues. Miscellane yep. Got it. So there's some numbers that gets reported by CalPERS, and the city takes its proportionate share out of that pension liability. And the way that they are reported on the financial statements, they have this thing called deferred inflows, which is fluxes in the investment earnings with respect to the investments that are located with CalPERS. And therefore, you'll see some of these fluxes in there impacting these full accrual financial statements or consolidated financial statements. Why have we not seen those influxes in the past year as just this year? Uh, it, it depends on how it performs. So it's, it's how the pension amounts perform, how the open trust fund performs, and there are years where they had good years, and there are years that are, I guess, consistently the same from one year to the other. So maybe this is for a later time, but I'd love to learn how that $200,000 difference impacts our overall $24 million budget, and if that's something we need to look at. Okay. And then my second question is um, understanding the difference between the letters. So on page 210, there's an initial letter, and then on page 341, there's the December 10th letter. Um, let me catch up with myself here. December 12th letter that we received. So there's one on 210 and then there's one on 341 that look pretty similar. And so you mentioned phases. Was this like phase one when that, and when it wasn't dated? So I wasn't sure how this. Um, I, I didn't have the agenda, but uh, I, I do remember sending a couple of letters. And the one is the communication with the city council. We are required in writing to tell you what the scope of the audit is. Okay. And whether we noted any difficulties in the audit or any findings with respect to the audit. So I assume that's the first letter. Probably the second letter is the GAN. I don't have the full agenda in there, okay. so I'm not sure. There's some, there are some findings on the December 12th. Yeah, so there's a past adjustment in there. The two letters are the internal control letter uh -huh. and the communication with governance letter. Yeah. Um, so I, I think what you're referring to is maybe the past adjustment in there. Um, am I, I, I apologize, I don't have the full agenda in there, so I'm not sure. Do you want me to pull up the two different letters? I think uh, finance director's correct. One is the governance communication letter and the other mm -hmm. is the internal control compliance letter. Okay. And so were there any findings in the December 12th? No. None? No. Okay. Does that conclude the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Council member Story, question? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for this audit. Um, I guess the one thing that jumped out to me, and I'll refer you to page seven of the audit, it's uh, agenda packet page 216, um, it are our unrestricted uh, uh, net uh, position. Um, negative. For 2019, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a negative $10.5 million. Yes. Um, and as I understand it, all due to the unfunded pension liability. Um, as hard as that is to swallow, what I do notice is that there's about a million dollar improvement from 2018. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, what was the explanation for that million dollar improvement? Did, are we doing better with our pension liability or do we incur some additional unrestricted uh, uh, income? Uh, it's actually the Dow Jones. Um, so the pension liability, is basically a gross amount less the investments is about I don't know half a trillion dollars invested in Sacramento with CalPERS and it performed really well during that measurement period so it drops um, and that's what caused it to it, it impacted your net position positively and therefore the number of I guess the deficit equity had dropped as a result of the improvement in the investment earnings. Okay. Um, I guess that's good news, but it sounds like that's a pretty volatile basis on which to rely on. Yes. You know, so a, I, a, I a net, what I view as a net gain <laughs> of a million dollars, but it could be ephemeral. 
Yes. Uh -huh. So the way that that number is calculated, I do not want to make it too complicated, but we do have this line item right there on that same statement called deferred inflows of resources. And it's basically taking those unusual fluxes and smoothing them out gradually through that net position. So you didn't get the full credit for the investment performance you will get it gradually over a five-year period. So ne if next year doesn't perform as well, then the number wouldn't flux as such. It's just that they're taking those fluxes and smoothing them out over a five-year period. So that improvement actually is a lot better than just one million dollars, I think, is what the flux. It, it actually, if you looked right there in the middle of the page, or if you look at the net pension liabilities, and I believe it's towards the back of the report, it did drop a lot more than just that $1 million. But we didn't give the city the entire credit. We gave it a portion of that credit in accordance with the reporting standards. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we will return now to public comment. Is there any uh, member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Saying none, we'll bring it back for council comment and is there a vote on this? Yeah, it's nope, just, just receiving report. report. Does anyone on the council have any comment on the report? Saying none, thank you so much. Thank We're gonna you. move on. Thank, thank you. you for your good work. Thank you. All right, and our final item for the evening, item 10E, uh, con uh, support a consolidated coastal development permit process for pure water SoCal. We have a staff. Um, Madam Mayor. Yes. Before we consider 10E, I live within 500 feet of the site um, where SoCal wants to install the injection well, so I need to recuse myself. All right, thank you. Yeah, we'll wait just a minute. <laughs> just trying to get home, really. <laughs> um, actually, um, what is the distance? Because I'm very close to that, too. I am fine. Thanks for checking. <laughs> I thought it was going to be far away. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Council. Um, before you tonight is not a decision. It's, um, we'll, we will be looking for a recommendation, but not a decision. Um, there is a project which I'm going to let the applicant speak to the details of the project. Tonight I just want to give you a brief overview of why we're here. Whenever um, there's a project that goes across jurisdictional boundaries, within the coastal zone rather than getting individual coastal development permits from each city and um, they can apply for a consolidated permit in which the uh, the coastal commission will review the consolidated permits we had a request from socal water district for the pure water socal project to um, participate in that consolidated permit process which is allowed under the coastal act um, so w one item, so they're looking for a recommendation from the city to allow that to occur. And in reading through the materials that they provided us in the EIR, I thought in our recommendation of uh, suggesting that they go forward with the consolidated permit, that we bring in a few of the mitigation items. These would be covered regardless due to the EIR, but there are significant unavoidable noise impacts that were brought up in the report. Um, and they're obligated to, for anybody that lives within 200 feet of the well that is at um, the Monterey well site, they're obligated to provide or offer alternative accommodations. And just in, in uh, the respect that typically when a CDP comes through the city, we go, we send out noticing to individuals and they have the opportunity to speak at our hearings. We did send out noticing uh, for this hearing, for this meeting tonight, just to let them know that we're considering the consolidated, allowing the consolidated permit, um, but added two conditions, one that, or, or not conditions, but suggestions to the Coastal Commission that they include in their consolidated permit, that first any properties within 200 feet be noticed 30 days in advance, um, have a meeting, a pre-construction meeting 30 days in advance, and that at that meeting and within the letter, they address the option of alternative accommodations. And then second, within 500 feet of the, 201 to 500 feet of the Monterey site, 
um, the pre-construction notice would go out 30 days prior with all the emergency con contact information for while the um, project is being built. So with that, um, our recommendation tonight is to authorize a consolidated coastal development permit application um, to be reviewed by the Coastal Commission. And we have Melanie Shoemaker here and Ron Duncan of SoCal Creek Water District. Yes, thank you for having us tonight. And I'll, just, I'll start it off with a quick note of appreciation. I think it's the season for your hard work and Katie and Matt's efforts with our staff were outstanding, so thank you on that. And I can't help but say, I see a police officer back here. We hold our meetings here and uh, they often are present. We really appreciate that, so shout out. And on a quick note response, they come in and help us. So Melanie's gonna dive into the heart of this, which I know is about how we're communicating with your residents, our customers also. Uh, but I just wanna say a couple things that you may not know. You know, in the big scale, Pure Water Soquel is an environmental uh, project to prevent further seawater intrusion from further contaminating our um, groundwater. So it's a, it's a project to create uh, safe, reliable groundwater in the future, now and into the future for future generations. What you may not know is that um, why we got wide community support, just recently uh, the EPA, federal EPA, awarded the project in the district a $49 million grant. And then <clears throat> on the heels of that, mainly due to Ms. Schumacher's uh, efforts, uh, and others too, but you were the spearhead, um, the State Water Board uh, showed their support in the tune of a $50 million grant, that's $50 million. And then further, they said this is the kind of model project they want to see throughout the state of California. They did, uh, they tacked on a $36 million low interest loan, like around 1.3%, which is fantastic. So I say that because our customers are your residents and that's good news for them because it, it you know, it helps them. Uh, with their rates and that sort of thing, lower cost. So that's that's the big picture stuff. And I, like I said, Melanie's going to dive into the heart of the stuff I think they're interested about. We just have a couple slides. Um, these are, of course, in the packet and in the request that we sent to um, the planning director. Um, here at the picture that we have here on the screen is one of the primary seawater intrusion prevention wells of the Pure Water SoCal project. This is the one that's located in Capitola, and it's actually an existing site that the Soquel Creek Water District currently owns. It's an inactive well, um, and it's tucked behind Shore Life Church where that arrow is that says the well site entrance gate. So this is a site that we've owned for a long time. It is um, very tucked away and hidden. And, and the next picture I'll wanna show the picture on the left is the existing site, so that um, does have um, some equipment and buildings that are associated <coughs> with a groundwater extraction well. For a seawater intrusion prevention well, what we foresee we would do is within the perimeter of our site, um, clear off almost everything that's above ground so that what would be left in that right side, which is the conceptual rendering, is the, uh, the seawater intrusion prevention well piping and some electrical and controls that are pushed up on the right side of the wall. The height of the ex uh, proposed infrastructure once built is has a very low profile. As you can say, it, it's basically somewhere between six and eight feet. Um, again, in most of the surrounding areas is um, a, that's a carport and a retaining wall from the Shore Life Church Apartments and then the trees and shrubs um, on the neighboring site. <coughs> um, I won't go into too me many details. We can go ahead and, and leave that for questions, but some of the um, items of concern, especially as we go through and we build the seawater intrusion prevention well and the pipeline is what kind of impacts we would have with the neighbors. So we have identified that most of the work would be associated with um, the noise that is that would happen during construction so during the in construction of the well site we will have drilling that will go on for a couple weeks both day and at night um, that is done both from the integrity of the well being drilled as well as just the kind of uh, reduction in the overall impacts for the neighbors is just to do it in a consolidated schedule 
Um, there also will be noise during the time when we're doing the pipelines. But once the infrastructure is in place, which within this area of Capitola will be just pipelines and the well site, once construction is done, noise will be very minimal. Um, it almost nothing because the recharge well really is uh, based upon more of a gravity flow from where the water is purified and then goes in there. There would be a small pump that we would have to run on a periodic basis just to backwash. And again, that's pretty, pretty low noise. Um, but we recognize, and what Ron said, is we are part of um, the neighborhood. Um, I'm a customer, I'm a resident in Soquel. Um, and so we, we recognize that we want to make sure that the outreach that we do, that the relationship that we build isn't just about the planning efforts and as we go forward with permitting, but would also go on during construction. And so here in, in this last slide is um, just some pictures of our outreach that we've done in the past. During the environmental impact report phase, we had many community meetings. That's the picture on the left. The picture in the middle was actually a community meeting that we held at Shore Life Church, which is right next door um, to the uh, Monterey Well site. And we had that meeting in November. And then the letter on the right um, was letters that we sent to the near nearby area to let them know that we are foreseeing and going forward with the construction. And as um, Ms. Hurley said, we will be doing those letters again. That's a best management practice that the district has been doing every time we do do new infrastructure, um, just like the granite well that we did in Aptos. We went through that same series. We sent letters out prior to construction on a 500-foot basis, and then we sent letters again in a more narrow and had a community meeting. We also, um, well, we called these people, but I was talking about the, yeah, yeah. And then um, what we also do is we send out contact information. So the neighbors in the nearby vicinity will have a direct line, 24-hour line, to our on-site geologist as the well is being drilled. And we also um, are providing preventative uh, measures for noise, like s um, sound barrier walls during the drilling, and options for the nearby residents to stay at a hotel if they so choose during the 24-hour construction. So we, you know, we continue to do that. I know that that is a, was a, a concern and of high importance to staff, and, and we want to build that into our process. So as we go forward with the uh, consolidated permit approach, and we, we hope that you guys um, would recommend that the Capitola would join on, on that, the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz have already um, submitted letters to the state that they are interested in doing that. And we have requested to um, the Coastal Commission that we be put on their March agenda item. Um, and so that would be a meeting that would be here in, in Scotts Valley. And we're, we're here for any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much. I will bring it back to the council for questions. Council Member Sawyer, <coughs> any questions? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, and I, I guess I just wanted to clarify that even if we, uh, uh, approve going with the consolidated application to the Coastal Commission, uh, we don't lose our voice during that process. We will just be more directly working through <coughs> with the Coastal Commission staff at that time. Is that is that a correct understanding of we I'm, could I'm submit see some head public head right. <laughs> yeah. We could submit comments to the Coastal Commission or you could make comments now and request that they be incorporated into the project description, but we would, in fact, be turning over permitting authority to the Coastal Commission. Um, okay. Well, I guess this is the time to make comments then, uh, which um, I'll reserve until later. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions <coughs> from Council? Yeah. Go ahead. You have a question? I do. Yeah. Um, so, pursuant to your policy in terms of uh, contacting neighbors, um, have you had conversations with the neighbors at this point? We, we have had some conversations. I'll let Melanie uh, dive into that particular. But I, I'd just like to say this is what we do. We put in wells, and um, we, we work with our neighbors, our customers. And so we've had great success, never really any issues on previous wells. So just to give you that setting. So what about this particular situation? So if you've had questions, yeah, I'd just like to know some of the concerns that they brought up and uh, the nature of that conversation, was that on the phone or did you go to their homes or was there an actual meeting at the church nearby perhaps? Sure, so we did send letters out um, to, hold on, I forgot my notes, so I wrote it on my hand. 
um, 200 foot radius um, back in November that we were um, going to be moving forward with the pre-design of the uh, well site. And we did um, follow up that with phone calls of the customers um, that we had phone numbers for in our account system. And we did get quite a few voicemails, but on those that we did um, connect with, and I think that there were about a handful, most of the concerns were just about when construction when it was going to occur and what, what we foresaw what the impacts would be. And so we did tell them that there would be noise impacts. We did tell them that there would be um, a duration of time where we would have to do the 24-hour drilling. There were some concerns related to the number of trucks and equipment that would be coming in and out of the neighborhood and when um, would would that be you know how would that how would, would the, the district handle that would that be during school time um, what was the level of expectations that that they may that they may want to know about beforehand and and that was about it from the like neighbors house neighbors when we had the meeting at the church we um, worked with the uh, pastor Trevor there he notified all of the apartment uh, complex residents there um, and um, the, the few people that showed up, it really was more about noise, and um, their request was that we have another meeting with them. Again, I think you know a lot of people have a lot of things on their plate. It's more about you know when the construction happens, will we be able to talk to them? And I think that's why staff has said when we get to that point, because for us the construction is still out a while, um, to still reserve that opportunity to meet with the neighbors, talk to them about the noise issues. And I think this is a, a proper way for staff to recommend that that be built in to your recommendation if you so choose to go with that consolidated permit approach so that you, you still have that kind of connection that the district will be notifying and working with your residents. Okay, um, so I know a lot of the neighbors around there and many of the families there have children. And the Gonzaleses, I think, are right on the other side of the fence from the well. Uh, there's two families there that actually have children, and um, across the street is a daycare center, so it could be quite disruptive for the kids there, perhaps, and I definitely hope you contact them. Yeah, you know, the, the uh, a, te a well that we recently did was right adjacent to the school, and I remember Melanie talk about, uh, that uses an opportunity to help uh, educate the kids, and talking about the smiling faces at the fence line, I believe is what you mentioned, kind of captured me. So. We have experienced exactly that uh, situation, and it turned into we made what could perceive as a negative experience into a, a good cooperative learning experience, and no negative feedback on that. So just yeah, yeah. yeah pursuant to our conversation, we had a conversation I think two days ago. So um, I mentioned to the super uh, the assistant superintendent of the Unified School District that you did have that experience with the people at um, Twin Lakes, the the school at Twin Lakes, and she thought it was a great idea. So. Uh, they're going to be waiting for your call. Well, and we've at, I've already asked our staff member who is conducting some of these meetings when as we get closer to reach out to the school. Great, great. We also um, have, it seems like schools are in neighborhoods just like our well sites. So uh, the Willowbrook site is also right next to a school, the Montessori School. And then our Twin Lakes Church pilot well that we did over the summer was next to the Twin Lakes Church. So um, we'll definitely make sure that we engage and prioritize um, near nearby schools. Yeah, my main concerns with the kids that would have to live through, I mean, sleep perhaps <laughs> into the drill and then, so I'm glad you're gonna attend to that, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, questions about duration. Uh, how long will the public be able to access these funds to if they want to relocate? The yeah, the go to a hotel is what we put them up in during oh. the, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah. How long the, how how long could they go to you know what are you what time frame do you figure that they could possibly be relocated? It's it's for the duration of the twenty four hour drilling, and so it's it's us it, well it could be as fast as three weeks. It depends on the different depths that the the well, the drill well has to go. So, in some cases where we're drilling down thousands of feet, it takes longer. This well we foresee is going to be a little bit more shallow. So somewhere between three and four weeks. Three and four weeks. Hopefully. We'll get more I into that as we go into the design um, and laying out the schedule, but that's about the duration. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, I just have a, a couple quick questions. So the, the 24 hour drilling for three to four weeks, if that weren't 24 hours, it was 12 hours, for example, it wasn't during the night, my uh, guess is that it would take six to eight weeks, correct? It would be a longer noise impact. Potentially, and it could even be longer because when you stop drilling for a certain amount of time, you run the risk of the hole caving in or the drill material being stuck down there. So um, it's not necessarily directly linear or double to the, to okay. the time. And then is there any flexibility, as, as mentioned, there's uh, you know, families with children and, and whatnot nearby, um, and I imagine that for, uh, for example, a family of four with young children, a hotel room wouldn't necessarily be the most appropriate. So is there flexibility in that for, uh, for example, an Airbnb or a short-term um, rental where they would feel more in, in, uh, like they're in a home rather than, than in a hotel room? Is, is that an opportunity as well, or is it strictly hotels? Yeah, that's a really good question. We can look into that. Typically, it's been just a local hotel in our area, um, but that is something we can look into. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. That was all the questions from the council, so we'll bring it to public comment. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this matter? Seeing none, we will bring it back to the council for uh, comments and deliberation. Council Member Story. Uh, thank you again, Mayor. Um, and one, I, I, this is a great project, um, and I'm really happy to see it coming to fruition. Just some of the thoughts that um, I would like to see, and it sounds like I need to get it in now or forever hold my peace. And so um, uh, one on the well site, I think it would be a great opportunity since w it's so near New Brighton School um, and the uh, school adjacent to it at the church um, that we develop that as some sort of educational life lab. Um, location, uh, put some um, educational uh, aspects to it, um, and also being part of the Arts Commission, you know, there's never a wall that the Arts Commission doesn't like to see uh, made more attractive. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity to collaborate with between the city, the water district, and the school district to uh, do something educational and more attractive there. Um, and on that lines of attractive, I noticed, um, um, you know, the old telephone pole, it looks like in the rendering that that same telephone pole is going to continue to exist. Since I imagine you're going to be doing some trenching, I think if it's feasible, um, it would be not only, not only safer, but also more attractive for that area if, that, uh, if the utilities could be underground. Um, the gravel, I... I don't find it particularly attractive or pleasing, and um, and so, but I get it. But if it's a maintenance issue, it seems like it's just because something's going to grow there eventually. Um, maybe better to just to plan ahead and anticipate it, and maybe put in something that's more green uh, than just crushed rocks. Um, and my last point is concerning and reading the report uh, on the trenching of the roads. Um, uh, Kennedy down the park um, uh, and up a bit um, and the way it reads in the report is that the roads will, re will be returned to their approximate condition prior to construction. Whenever I see something like approximate condition, uh, okay, I, I know I'm going to see this stripe down the road or a dip where the trenching was done um, and I would like to see at least say in as good a condition as prior to the construction and ideally uh, maybe better when we did the project in the jewel box with the sanitation district we they worked with us they and we re slurried so it, it really became um, almost like a new road and you never saw you don't you do not see uh, the results of that uh, trenching that was done so um, I would like to maybe see something. And if working with, this with us to maybe um, um, contribute to that, I don't know when this is going to be done or what those road conditions would be, but I think that if we could work together to make the road better than what it was prior to the trenching um, and not just approximately in the same condition. So um, those are my thoughts on the project. Um, but with that, full speed ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Councilmember Bertrand. 
So I would like to reiterate my concerns that I communicated in our conversation. I'm very concerned about the um, families nearby, especially the ones with children, and I'm very heartened to hear that you're going to be providing something that could make up for that uh, disruption in their life. Um, my other suggestion was to reach out to New Brighton School, and Sam and I, I think, would like that to be a learning case, learning opportunity. I think that's a good one. I'd like to add two things uh, based on Sam's question. I didn't know this would be our last chance to really make a major comment. Um, two things occur to me. I'm familiar with that little driveway that goes to the site. Um, I haven't closely looked at it, but it's not in the best of condition, and it does provide access to the uh, apartment house down at the end of the driveway. And so maybe uh, in terms of improvements to the area because of uh, the impact and stuff, that might be a good thing to do is make sure that road is made better. Um, the th my, fourth my fourth comment is in terms of public education, maybe having some sort of explanatory sign on the fence itself detailing what this project, what the purpose of this facility is. Maybe uh, people, w as they walk by there and such like that, and they might respect it a little bit more if they realize this is something for public benefit. Thank you. Councilmember Rotor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think most of the comments that I've concerned about have been brought up. I, I, I do, I did just saw the look, funny look on your face when uh, Councilmember Member Story suggested some planting back there where you had gravel. I understand it's a construction site, and also, uh, you're an advocate of uh, conserving water, so I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with the gravel being back there. It's not a park. It's, uh, it's basically a remote area for just your pipe, so I, I don't have deep concerns over that. I am concerned about Monterey Avenue, though. We just recently paved that, and I, I think the language that you probably use is just some standard language that probably is in the lots of contracts to return to as, as is condition, but uh, just make a note here that that road's in pretty good shape and we're, we're, we're looking forward to it being that way for a long time. So that's it. Uh, do we need a uh, uh, recommend, do we need a motion to approve a cultural action? I'm gonna go ahead and make Authorize. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion. Let's, I'll read it right here. Make a motion to authorize a consolidated coastal development permit. Second. We have a motion and a second. Did we, we brought this to public comment already? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, sorry, got, got a little lost in the agenda there. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And we have it on record that uh, Council Member Brooke has abstained yeah. or recused. Yes, so any abstentions? None, and with that, uh, motion carries. That brings us to the end of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Meeting is <laughs> adjourned. There you go.